from John 4, and we will ask Brother Samora if he could read these scriptures, John 4, verses 1 through 24.
15. The woman said to, to him, Sir, give me this water that you may not, that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. He just answered to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. He says, said to her, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you are now have, excuse me, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. 19, the woman said to, to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and the Jews says that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to ought worship. 21. So the last verse. 24. 24. 24. 24. 24. 21. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. You know the you know what we we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Twenty-four the last verse. God is spirit, and those who worship him must Worship him in spirit and in truth. May the Lord have his blessings to the reading. Amen. Amen. Tonight we continue our studies on giving. And the topic is uh, true and acceptable worship in giving. And yesterday we introduced the subject. And those of you who are hearing me for the first time, I need to remind you that I speak English with an accent. Oh. Um, yesterday we covered the introduction to the lesson. And one thing we reminded ourselves of is that Christianity is a given religion. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We are enjoying life in Christ because God decided to give. And therefore, as a rule, he who laughs must of necessity be a giver. If you love God, then it wouldn't be a hard thing for you to give to support the kingdom of God on earth. We read Matthew chapter 20. And verse 28, where the Lord Jesus said, He did not come into this world to be served, but He came to serve, and that He gave His life a ransom for many. So Jesus is a giver, and He will continue to be a giver. Okay. We therefore concluded that it is contramentary for a Christian not to be a giver. And therefore we are trying our best here to understand the concept of giving and the blessings that are associated with cheerful and acceptable giving in Christianity. Yesterday we talked about the concept of giving to God. And we said we give to God through the church. 
And we came to the point that the congregation, every local congregation needs money. We need money to do God's work. And that's why God is asking us to give in our local churches. So that we can carry out the work that he has given to us. Especially the great commission that has been given to us as his children. Come to think of it, great commission, we call it, as opposed to the limited commission that was given to the disciples of Christ in Luke chapter 10. You remember in Luke 10 and Matthew 10, Jesus sent out his disciples. But he limited them as to where they should go to propagate the word. He asked them not to go to any other Gentile nation, but rather they should go to the lost sheep of Israel only. And when they go, they should tell the Israelites the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Thus making it a limited commandment that the Lord gave. This is opposed to the great commission that he gave to his disciples following his resurrection. In the great commission, the Lord Jesus said, Go ye into all the world. In the limited commission, he said, Go only to the lost sheep of Israel. Therefore, theologians have come up with these qualities, the limited commission, and then the Great Commission. The Great Commission is cosmic in nature. It's global, it's universal. The Lord is asking his church to go into all the world and preach the gospel. What a task. Now, how can we go into all the world if we do not have money? So, it is logical and it is scriptural, more importantly, that each congregation should have money. And this money should come from all of us. The churches can get enough money to carry out the work that the Lord has given to us if each and every one of us will decide to give faithfully. So yesterday we talked about the need for faithfulness in giving. We reminded ourselves that even during the personal ministry of Christ, the Bible tells us Christ had a box that contained money. And Judas Iscariot was carrying that box. We also learned that the Bible tells us Judas Iscariot was a thief. And he used to steal money from Jesus' box. That should, of course, inform us the reason why when the devil was looking for one of them to betray Jesus through money, he chose Judas because he was a thief already. We don't come to the lost house and be called thieves. I don't want to be called a thief. And I think that is the reason why we are trying to search the scriptures to find out how we can be more acceptable to God through our giving. So take these lessons personal. Don't look at any other body, any other person besides you. Think about yourself. If you have a question, it should be a personal question coming from you. You shouldn't have a meeting with anybody. But then, the Holy Spirit tells us God is not poor. And yesterday we read Psalm number 50, from verse 9 through 15, where Jehovah God told us, I am not poor. And even if I were, I would not ask you for anything. That's telling us that we do not make God richer by our giving, no? We just want to obey Him. He only puts us to test. He tests our hearts. He tests our faith by asking us to give 
to the church. We cannot make God any richer. He is fully loaded already. And we do not send our monies to heaven, but we give them over here. The whole idea of giving to God through the church is that we want to be supporters of kingdom business, we call. The church is God's kingdom on earth. And it is the responsibility of the church to carry out those divine tasks. And we realize that the Bible is right because there is nothing we can do without money. And as a church, we need to know why we give our monies and then how. Yesterday we said if the church, the local church, has money, she will be able to support her preachers and evangelism at large. Let us think about that. Our preachers must be taken good care of so that they can do the work wholeheartedly. If we are unable to support our preachers, the work will suffer. And when we say the work is suffering, it means it's going to affect our spiritual development. Because that man in the pulpit is unable to deliver unto the church such spiritual food that our souls need. Anything goes there becomes the norm. So the preacher will come and tell you a whole lot of stories. The preacher will be in the pulpit and uh, behave as if he is uh, uh, somebody who is cracking jokes. He will not get to, into the world because he doesn't even have the time to do that. We need to support our preachers <coughs> and support them well. And we need to support world evangelism. World evangelism begins from your community. Are you able to evangelize your world, your level world? Have you been able to send monies overseas so that you can have a hand in overseas missions? This is the work of the church. We also remind ourselves that if the church has money, it would enable the church to do a lot of benevolence to the needy and poor and the vulnerable in our society. Is this not what Jesus came to do? In the book of Acts, chapter 1 and verse number 1, I'm not going to read from here, but write it down. We want to cover a lot of stuff tonight, so please do where to write some things down. In the book of Acts, chapter 1 and verse number 1, Luke, the physician, writing to Theophilus, said, O oh, Theophilus, the former account that I made had to do with all the things that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Now, check it out from your Bible. Let me show you something. Of all the things Jesus began, both to do and to teach. And I wonder, why does the doing precede the teaching in that verse? Have you thought about it? All that Jesus began both to do and to teach, instead of both to teach and to do, it's very, very significant. Jesus did not only come into this world to teach people. He did some things. And all the things that Jesus did, we can bring from the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What did he do? I see him healing hundreds of people. I see Jesus freeing thousands of people in my Bible. I see Jesus being compassionate towards those who were in need. And this 
is the church of Christ. Do people see these virtues in us? If not, why not? If not, how can we claim to be the church of the Lord if you are not helping people? That's one of the reasons why you and I must be faithful in our giving so that the congregation can get the monies to carry out these things in and on behalf of you and I in the name of Christ. So churches spend their monies so that they can do things in Christ's name. And it is a way of evangelism. And this was the strategy that was adopted by the Lord Jesus in the Gospels. You cannot read about any other thing. Now think about the idea of Jesus feeding 4,000 people at a time. 4,000. 4,000 people. And another time, he fed 5,000. We have two records of Jesus feeding people in the Gospels. So at least 9,000 people were fed by the Lord Jesus. We don't say that as his church, we must feed people. We must feed people. Some of the times in North America and Europe, some people think that, oh, I mean, everybody is okay. It's not true. Find them. You search for them and you find them. You go to uh, Los Angeles and you got a lot of people who live under bridges. They need food. And the Lord Jesus knew what he was talking about in Matthew 25 when he said, I was hungry, but you did not feed me. And to another group, he said, I was hungry, and you fed me. So we are trying to search the scriptures to find out how we can worship God in a more acceptable manner when it comes to giving. I want to give so that people might be blessed. I want to give so that I can obey my God. I want to give so that I can put smiles onto the faces of the many, many, many people living on the face of this earth who do not have any hope. So that I give a grateful acknowledgement of God's grace bestowed upon me. So many people do not have the opportunities we have here tonight. Stop complaining and begin to count your blessings. Stop the complaints. Shame on you. He takes care of you. Some of the times it doesn't have to do with the things we need. We cry over the things we want. And there's difference between needs and wants. Most of our worries are on things that we only want. We wish we could have 20 cards. Question, for what? What are you going to do with those? So the church must do benevolence. The church must render benevolent services to the millions of people who go hungry every single day. And the Lord Jesus said, I was thirsty, but he never gave me a drink. This afternoon I was having a discussion with somebody online, and everything you talk about, he said, oh, no, that's not the meaning, it's not literal. But when Jesus said, I was thirsty, let me tell you, it is literal. People are thirsty. They want clean water to drink. Those of us from Ghana, because of this galaxy thing. Most of the water bodies in Ghana have been polluted. And people are literally drinking dirt, probably in your village. And you drink good water in Canada. And you are happy. And you don't keep in hopes that some way, somehow, your congregation, probably you alone cannot do it. That is why God is asking me to give 
and asking you to give so that together we can get something with which we can help the millions of people around the world. Amen. We can get so many communities water wells. But it costs money. We can help so many to get safe drinking water, but it costs money. So I want to be happy when the Lord asks me to give. Because my giving is going to accomplish something good. There is something called edification. Edification includes a lot. It involves a lot. Each and every one of you is sitting down now, with the exception of me. We want to make you feel comfortable, even as we listen to the Word of God. The church will have to use monies to buy the pews. If you should hear me more clearly, there is a need for this, there is a need for the speakers, there is a need for the amplifiers and everything. The leadership of your congregation does all these things so that you will be built up. You will be able to get the word of God at least in a somewhat comfortable environment. So when we talk edification, it involves a whole lot of things. The study material that we need, preparing people to get the word of God and then come over here, pass them on to us. Everything that we need to help the membership 